I recently found this rather interesting induction heater circuit for cheap on eBay. By simply adding a helical coil to its output terminal and applying 12 volts to its input terminal, I can place a metal object inside the coil and thus efficiently heat it up to a point where it glows red. And just like that I can start cutting through things with a hot exacto knife, because sadly this is the kind of content way too many people enjoy watching. But how does this induction heating and the circuit actually work? Can we build one by ourselves? And which materials can be heated up? Let's find out. First off, I used my multimeter to track the circuit paths of the PCB in order to find out how the components are connected to one another. The reverse engineered circuit diagram only features a handful of components and is awfully similar to the circuits that I created for my DIY ArcLighter project. The only difference is that instead of a center tapped coil with one constant current source, this new circuit uses a more common coil without a tapped center, but with two constant current sources. This way, after powering the induction heater, a sine voltage and current is created at the output of the circuit, and thus the coil creates a changing sinusoidal magnetic field. Now if I stick my finger inside the coil, the input current does not increase, and I feel nothing differently about my finger, except that the coil slowly heats up due to the flowing current. But if I take a metal conductor, form a loop with it and place it inside the coil, we can measure a small voltage across it according to the law of electromagnetic induction. If we now close the loop, we basically created a short circuit and thus a current will flow through the inductor which is also noticeable by the increase of the input current. Since the equivalent circuit for this arrangement is just a resistor based on the dimensions of the conductor, we can assume that the generated heat is proportional to the resistance and the flowing current. And now that we understand the basics of induction heating for a piece of wire as a loop, we can apply this knowledge to three different metals which I brought into a smaller shape beforehand. Here we got aluminum, brass and iron. After placing the aluminum inside the coil, the input current increased by 900 milliamps, because this time there's not just one current path inside this material, but dozens of them, which therefore increased the overall current flow. Such currents are also called eddy currents, and are usually undesirable since they represent a power loss. That is also why the iron core of a transformer usually consists of isolated plates instead of one complete piece of metal. But let's focus on the aluminum and let's add a timer to the experiments. After 30 seconds inside the coil, the material reach a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So let's see whether brass can excel this temperature. This time the material increased the input current by 1 amp and after 30 seconds reach a temperature of 48 degrees celsius. That is around 10 degrees more than the aluminum piece and actually not that surprising since brass possesses a higher resistance. Last but not least we got iron, which after placing it inside the coil lowered the input voltage to such an extent that I had no choice but to put the two channels of my power supply in parallel and tried it again. But even with twice the current, it was not enough, so I was forced to only insert the tip of the material, which already increased the input current by 4 amps. After 30 seconds inside the coil, the tip of the iron easily reached a temperature of 106 degrees Celsius, which is quite a big difference compared to the other two. The reason for that is for one its higher resistance, but also its ferromagnetic characteristic which means it can stick to a magnet and can also be magnetized through a magnetic field. The process of magnetizing and demagnetizing happens inside the coil and thus creates another kind of power loss, known as the hysteresis loss. And that is basically the reason why ferromagnetic materials heat up a lot faster than other materials, and thus are favored when it comes to something like inductive cooking. At the end, let's gather a couple of components and see whether we can build such a circuit by ourselves. 
According to the simple schematic, I connected all components to one another with a bit of silver copper wire in midair. Since I will be using a maximum voltage of 12 volts and a current limit of 3 amps, I do not necessarily need Xena diodes to protect the gates from voltages above its limits and pull down resistors to prevent latch ups, but it is definitely recommended for higher input voltages. It is also important to use a fast diode to discharge the gate in a fast manner, a MOSFET with a higher maximum drain to source voltage than the resonance voltage and a capacitor which can handle the excessive voltage and current as well. But those VIMA MKP capacitors are usually a safe bet. The last mandatory component is the coil itself. For that I used 2mm thick enamel copper wire which I wound around a 20mm plastic pipe for around 10 turns. After removing the insulation from its ends, soldering them to the circuit and powering it all up, we successfully created our own induction heater that can transfer enough energy to let metal glow red. Now if you have more questions about the utilized circuits then definitely check out my ArcLighter project and the previous hacked episode about the CCFL inverter. If you liked this episode and maybe learned something new as well then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time.